Um, hello everyone and good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Sophie Crouch. Uh, I'm a project coordinator working at Mentamon as part of the Selkie project and I'll just be chairing today's session. Um, as I'm sure you may know, having registered for the session, this is a series of events um, organised by the Selkie project and it's focused on providing business support for companies in the marine energy industry um, as well as those looking to diversify into the sector. So these events will give your company the opportunity to learn more about key themes from experts in the sector to help in your endeavours to enter and work in a really innovative and growing industry. It will also give you the opportunity to network and meet with other companies and hopefully hear about the various projects and developments going on. Um, so today is actually the fourth session we've had in the series and we'll be focused on legal considerations for offshore marine projects and we're delighted to be joined by our expert today, Jamie Ritchie. So Jamie is a key member of the projects team at a leading Irish law firm, LK Shields, um, and Jamie advises clients across um, a number of sectors on infrastructure, construction, energy and commercial legal requirements. And I'm sure he'll tell us all about it, but um, he has great experience working on offshore project cases in locations across the world uh, and has a fantastic depth of experience and expertise on legal complexities for offshore project delivery and risk management. So I'm sure today will be a really fantastic session. Um, just before we officially get started and have a quick introduction to Selkie, I'll just run through a few housekeeping guidelines. Um, and just for your information. So just if everyone could keep themselves on mute um, and just remain on mute unless indicated, just to prevent any feedback. I'm sure you all know this from um, lots of Zoom and, and team sessions you've been on. But um, after hearing from Jamie this morning, we'll be holding a live sort of Q&A. So please feel free to submit your questions via the chat as we go or indeed during the Q&A. Um, and if you wish to ask your question yourself, um, you're welcome to use the raised hand function and we'll call your name and you can answer your question or ask your question. <laughs> um, if you need any assistance at any point, just put a message in the chat as well. We've got the Selkie team on hand to, to keep things running smoothly. Um, and if you're on social media, please do follow us. Um, you can mention at Selkie Project and use the hashtag meet the expert on Twitter and LinkedIn. And Lastly, just to note, this session will be recorded and shared on our website in the coming days. So you'll be able to go back, uh, use it as a resource or share it with any contacts that may also find it useful. So before I officially introduce our speaker, um, I just give a very quick uh, sort of overview of the Selkie project for those of you who don't know or would just like an update. So if you just bear with me two seconds, I'll just share my screen. Hopefully that's all visible there. Um, so I know some of you will have seen this presentation multiple times if you've been to a few of our Meet the Experts, but I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, so just as a bit of background, the Selkie project is a cross-border project between Wales and Ireland. Um, and we're bringing together leading researchers and businesses in the marine energy industry. Um, so you can see on screen, we're led by six partner organizations. And we have an overall aim to streamline the pathway towards commercialization for the marine energy industry. So we are funded through the European Regional Development Fund as part of Interreg and the Islands of Wales programme. Um, so we are a highly collaborative project between the partner organisations across Wales and Ireland. Um, and we can broadly kind of describe our work as being working on research and development as well as industry engagement. So as part of the project activity, Selkie aims to support the industry by developing a set of multi-use technology tools bespoke to the region and improving services that will assist developers and supply chain companies to ultimately progress further towards commercialization. So you can see um, the tools on the screen now. So we've got a range of things from foundations and moorings design to GIS tools for wave and tidal sites. Um, and as part of the project, we will be testing um, the tools to trial them on wave and tidal devices 
um, looking at their reliability and commercial potential. So we'll be doing that with Tidal developer Sabella and Wave developer Ocean Energy. So some really exciting uh, research going on as part of the project. But also alongside their development, we're engaging with businesses, providing knowledge transfer and ultimately building a network of companies across Wales and Ireland uh, working in the sector. So we do encourage um, quite a vast range of businesses to get involved, whether they'd be working on technology development or providing services through the supply chain, uh, and even companies that are looking to diversify from other sectors. Um, it's a great opportunity to sort of be part of a, of a network of businesses and to learn from industry and gain knowledge from leading experts um, and a fantastic way to build contacts really in a, in a fast growing industry. Um, so it is free to join the network and businesses can receive a range of support as part of the project, um, which may include full training in the tools that I mentioned before, um, as well as input into the development of new to industry products. And we can also assist with things like data analysis and modeling work. And then perhaps a bit more generally, we also provide knowledge transfer from industry experts, such as events like today. And then we can also provide more tailored business support and networking opportunities. Um, so on screen now, you can see just some of the businesses that are already part of the network. So you can see LK, LK Shields is on there as well as, as one of our members. Um, so just at a glance, it's uh, clear that there's quite a broad range of companies involved. So we really do encourage everyone to join. Um, so if you would like to hear more about the network um, and projects, I've just left my email on screen there. there. So just uh, please do get in touch and I'd be happy to have a chat. Um, but I think for now, we will return to the purpose of today's session. And I'll, I'll stop talking for a bit and I'll introduce today's speaker, Jamie Ritchie from LK Shields. I'll leave the floor to you, Jamie. Thank you uh, very much, Sophie. Just bear with me for a second while I put my slides up on screen. Sylvie, can you see those okay now? Yep, that's perfect. So, Thanks, excellent. Well, listen, thank you very much to everyone for, for joining me here today um, to talk about offshore construction. Um, I'm going to look at offshore construction specifically in the context of the renewable sphere. This um, is, is very much a carbon copy of a, a talk which I gave to the um, Irish Construction Law Conference back in December uh, 2020. I am a, a projects lawyer at heart, so I, I, my focus when looking at these projects is to look at things from, from a construction perspective. But similarly, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a spider in the web in the sense that I have to, on offshore projects, I have to coordinate with my commercial colleagues, corporate team, property, banking colleagues um, in, in many cases. So to, to be a project lawyer in this space, you, you have an awful lot to coordinate. Um, and it means that I'm in a reasonably uh, good position to, to talk about um, what the structures, um, contractual structures might look like um, for, for an offshore project. As a lawyer, I've had the, um, the unique opportunity to advise on um, quite a number of offshore projects. Now, admittedly, the, a lot of these have been in the telecom sphere. So I've advised on subsea cabling systems between Ireland uh, and other countries, but I also um, had the opportunity to draft uh, construction contracts and project agreements for one of the very first wave energy power plants, which was a proposed 100 megawatt scheme off the west coast of Africa. Um, and I also routinely advise on onshore renewable projects. So. My intention today is to take some of that collective knowledge um, and to talk to you a little bit about the trajectory of the market in Ireland, um, risks and indeed some opportunities. Um, so without further ado, I'll move on to the, the very first slide. Um, why does this, this matter to the industry? Well, um, Ireland's going through um, a, a bit of a transformation at the moment with renewable energy. There's a huge focus um, on meeting targets. And um, Ireland has one of the largest seabeds in Europe. Um, we have the sixth largest um, exclusive economic zone. Our maritime area is 490,000 square kilometres. So if you put that into perspective, the land mass of Ireland is 84,000 square kilometres and the land mass of GB 
is around 209,000 square kilometers. So our, our, our maritime area is, is, is greater than, than both of these islands combined, um, which gives you uh, an idea of the, the scale of the opportunity. And I think with floating offshore, um, the, the projects moving further and further out to sea, um, that's where you're gonna be seeing the, the, the maximum being made out of these opportunities. Um, as a construction lawyer, it interests me, um, particularly because uh, it, of the scale of the opportunity. Um, it's going to be offshore renewables projects construction is going to be one of the biggest uh, percentage increases to the gross fixed capital formation, um, which sort of takes into account all construction value in Ireland um, over the next two decades. Um, so it, it behooves any um, commercially minded contractor to, 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 to pay attention. Um, and also it's extremely relevant to any developer or project sponsor or anyone that really has a, a, a stake in, in a renewables project because a lot of these uh, projects depend heavily on the contracts. Um, and it's amazing how so often you get to the stage of looking, you, know, you go through the, the conceptual planning, the corporate structuring, and then you get to the stage of, well, how are we going to build this? And um, there's a commercial issue that arises at the last minute that, that, it, that means that everything has to be renegotiated. So that the, the contractual structuring and the construction elements are crucial. So in terms of the developing market, um, I mean, I'm probably, um, probably giving information here that, that a lot of people are already aware of, but I think it's useful to set the scene. Um, Ireland has, the Republic of Ireland has just around 250 wind farms and on the island of Ireland there's 368, um, all onshore basically bar the Arklow Bank wind farm um, as of 2021. Now there's going to be a seismic shift in a very short space of time. Um, we've had a lot of activity, uh, seven renewables projects were granted relevant status last year by the Irish government which means that they're supporting them um, that included the Oriel Wind Park, Bray and Kishbanks, Codling Wind Park 1 and 2, Scarred Rocks uh, and the North Irish Sea Array. But that's by no means um, all of the projects that, that are on the horizon. I'm aware of at least um, 30 prospective projects which um, you know, have a very good chance of going ahead. Um, and in the past 24 mar months, the relevant department has received over 50 site um, investigation applications in relation to offshore wind farm activity. So um, you can see how much this is going to grow really quickly. Um, and it's it's critical um, to delivering Ireland's 70% uh, renewable energy target by 2030. Obviously, this all has to be placed in the context of the European Green Deal and um, the Renewable Energy Support Scheme, which came into effect um, last year. And Ireland needs one gigawatt of offshore wind by 2025 to meet the five gigawatt target by 2030. So you can see you can see that there's a huge challenge there um, and it will take significant entrepreneurialism and um, you know, opportunity to get there. Um, so I think that just sets the scene. Um, now I'm going to move on to talk about what the contracts might look like. Um, Generally speaking, um, I've, I've certainly never really come across uh, a preferred standard across the offshore industry, whether it's a telecommunications project, whether it's um, you know, an, an offshore gas platform or a pipeline or, or anything or a wind farm. The, the types of contracts tend to uh, change um, and it really depends on the commercial appetite. Um, those of you who uh, are are familiar with, with working with, with specific industry forums. You'll see the ones that I've listed out there. And um, they all have their own quirks, but the reality is that they're always heavily amended to, to suit the individual project. So um, it really does depend heavily on the nature of the project and the risk profile. Uh, you have, broadly speaking, two structures that could be used, and I'm, I'm sort of dumbing this down a little bit, but it, it, you've got EPCI, which is your engineering, procurement, construction and installation, which is, if you forgive the terminology, the full turnkey solution. And then you've got the multi-contracting approach, which splits out all of the packages. And obviously there, there's an enormous amount of contractual packages that might exist in any offshore project. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, but generally speaking, those are the, 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 the two preferred routes um, to, to construction. Uh, the fact that these projects are so expensive to deliver 
you know, you've got disproportionate capital costs is often a key consideration. And, um, you know, for that reason, you, you, you would tend to find that multi-contracting tends to be preferred, particularly by the contractors, unsurprisingly. Um, but there are circumstances where an EPCI would be preferred, particularly if you have a, a particular investor in the background that wants that. Um, in terms of the, the main standard forms, well, I've got FIDIC there. FIDIC is the biggest um, onshore uh, type of contract that's used a standard form um, in Ireland for onshore renewables. Um, and the uh, 1999 Yellow Book has now been superseded by the 2017 edition. So that, that's a standard form that, again, would be heavily amended, but it's, it's very well set up to deal with offshore um, projects. Uh, OG UK is the preferred type of contract for offshore oil and gas projects, and so it's very much used in um, the North Sea. And it, it, again, it is capable of adaption. Um, it's very employer friendly, um, unlike FIDIC, which is a bit more balanced. Um, I think that's just, you know, in, in, in the context of the, the nature of the types of employers who are building out uh, offshore gas platforms or, 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 or oil um, uh, facilities. Uh, NEC4 uh, is uh, now being fairly widely embraced um, uh, in Ireland on onshore projects. Um, and I'm aware of it being used rather successfully in places like New Zealand for offshore wind projects. Uh, it's probably, I think what there's a new contract that they're releasing called the, or have, have released called the Design, Build and Operate contract. And I think that that could very well lend itself to more of an EPCI structure. So watch this space. It could be one that you, you see being used. Um, and then you've got the Shipbuilders Association of Japan contract, the Norwegian 2000 uh, Association of European Shipbuilders contracts. Again, all capable of adaption. Um, the important thing to remember is, uh, I mean, if you're if you're dealing, unless you have um, significant familiarity in dealing with these particular types of contracts, you're you're probably going to find that, that what happens on a on a project of the project of this scale is that you have a, if you have a funder or an investor in the background, they're going to want to see something that is based on the standard forms and then also accounting for all the risks that they want to catch as well. Um, and invariably, you know, lawyers will, will get involved. Um, so um, that the contract ends up being, as I say, very bespoke. Um, and then you've got BIMCO supply time and women time, and they are um, effectively dealing with the charter party contracts. So supply of vessels, uh, wind time is, is one that's specifically used for the offshore wind market. So um, you, you have a wind time contract um, if you are looking to um, hire a, a jack-up vessel, for example. So I thought it would be useful. I've put together um, this slide just setting out what an example structure for an offshore wind project in Ireland uh, might look like. And I, I think it's it's a pretty um, reasonable depiction. Uh, you can see there, this is an EPCI structure and there's an awful lot going on. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, but you can see there the EPCI contractor sits on top of you know, the, the, the main packages, including the turbine supply, tar, rotor blades, components, um, main civils contractor, specialist subcontractors, of which there will be many. Um, and then you've got your charter party contracts, um, specialist suppliers, and then professional teams. And there will be loads of project security that will be going upstream as well. Um, one thing that characterizes construction contracts and in particular offshore projects is just the sheer scale of documentation that is involved in it. So again, significant amounts of, of, of documentation to coordinate and keep track of. Um, and that's just the EPCI contract. I mean, then you've got you know, the O1M piece, which follows the operations and maintenance piece, which might be carried out by the EPCI contractor. You've got network distributor agreements um, and then the off taker. Um, I've drafted this to take account of the new um, legislative arrangements that will be coming in to effect in Ireland, hopefully in the not too distant future. So I'm talking about um, the Marine um, Act or Maritime Area. Uh, Planning Act, the MAP bill, um, which I'll come on to in the next slide. So it now makes for a, a marine area consent um, or a MAC, which is a single consent mechanism. So I've factored that into this, this structure. But yeah, there's a, there's a lot to consider there. 
Um, so I think that's just useful. And I can circulate these slides to attendees afterwards um, just to, to give you an idea um, if you want to ever refer back to it for future reference. So moving on then just to the, the where things currently stand in terms of the offshore market and the, 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 the regulatory framework here. Um, it's currently governed by the foreshore uh, licensing regime um, now and, and leasing regime. It, I'll come on to this in the next slide, but it's really effectively been long um, established that the, the foreshore regime is out of date. Um, it, it needs updating, um, and, and that's where the, 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 the map bill will come into that. But currently, this is what we work with. So when I'm doing telecommunications projects um, or, or, or other types of offshore projects where the, the foreshore um, market is, or foreshore licenses are then engaged. So developments requiring um, uh, exclusive occupation would, would, would include you know, jetties, bridges, piers, marinas, wind farms. Uh, they, they require a lease, um, whereas a license um, would be required for undersea pipelines and cables because you know, cables can go over the top of other cables depending on their um, their proximity arrangements as can pipelines. So uh, they don't have to meet exclusive occupation. Um, and in order to develop out an, an offshore energy project currently, you go through your site investigation process um, as you would um, and you then submit that to the relevant department. You're also gonna then need to put in together your sort of commercial case um, and then get planning permission and uh, consent from the Commission of Regulation of Utilities in, in Ireland. So there's there's quite a detailed um, uh, series of steps, but the important point to note is that it only goes out to 12 miles offshore. Um, and obviously the, our marine area is much larger than that. So it's not really fit for purpose. So in view of significant um, consultation from within the industry um, towards uh, the government here, uh they launched a consultation i think it was back in around certainly the, i think the most recent consultation was in 2018 to 2019 and um all the the, the major players in in the industry and, and, and the outside of ireland uh wrote to the to the government and, and had said that um effectively that the foreshore regime needed replacing it was it was acting as a barrier to progress and if we were to meet our targets we needed to to really act and create a new regulatory framework. So the new marine area planning uh, bill um, is sort of the genesis of that. Uh, it was described or was called the Marine Planning Development Management Bill last year. Um, the scheme for that was passed, I think, in and around December 2019 by the, the government. And then um, it then was then put on the, the legislative agenda um, and there were positive noises back in December when I gave this conference that it was going to be uh, dealt with in, in the first term of the Oireachtas um, in Ireland this year, um, but it, it wasn't. Now in April, what happened was it was re-announced or re restyled as the Marine Area Planning Bill. Um, now, say the way it works is that the regime will replace existing state development consent regimes, streamline arrangements, um, on the basis of a single consent principle, the whole concept being that it's faster, it's easier to secure. Um, you'll have your MAC, which is the Marine Area Consent to Enable Occupation, uh, a single environmental assessment, and the relevant minister with responsibility for issuing MACs um, in connection with the developments um, in the, the economic uh, zone and on the continental shelf um, will then submit a planning interest and um, it, the initial proposal will be submitted or declared, uh, following which developer may seek leave to, to apply for planning permission. Importantly, existing foreshore licensing arrangements will carry over uh, on, under transitional arrangements. So you know, that, that's important for, for a lot of the, the projects that have been applied for on that basis. Um, and there will be um, you know, transitional arrangements for the for foreshore functions of the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, the Minister of Environment, Climate and Communications will be responsible for um, renewables projects um, in this context. And the Minister of Housing will have responsibility for all other projects. So one of the quirks of Ireland is that the Minister for Housing is uh, responsible for subsea telecommunications projects approval. 
it's just one of the things that we have here um, and they've been heavily involved in the um, uh, all of the uh, consultations around the new act uh, and front and center in that um, so a lot of the, the updates that you receive would come out of the, the Minister of Housing uh, or sorry for the, the Department of Housing um, and as I mentioned earlier I think that there's going to be a new concept of near shore as well which will probably deal with those things like marinas, jetties, um, promenades, uh, things that can allow for greater local authority involvement. Um, I just thought, because I am a construction lawyer, I'd mentioned the Construction Contracts Act. Um, it's uh, not, to, not, to, not to bore everyone to death, but it's, it's in relation to payment. Um, so uh, in the UK, you have your Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act. Um, which uh, effectively regulates payment within the construction industry. Now, in the UK, it's been well established that offshore projects do not form part of land and therefore cannot be captured by um, that legislation. Um, and that was in a case that, that, I've, that I've noted there, Stavely Industries, where um, they, they'd effectively said that, uh, or argued that it, that it did, um, an offshore project did form part of the land, but the court held that um, it didn't because they were found in the seabed below the low water mark and therefore cannot be structures forming part of um, the land. Um, ironically enough, in that case, that was sort of um, uh, observed obiter, um, but in, in, in this case, they, they, they actually failed because uh, the, it was more of a jurisdictional point that the offshore project that they were looking to um, adjudicate on uh, under the, the, the relevant legislation uh, actually was well outside of uh, UK territorial waters. It was in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so that, that presented a jurisdictional problem for them. Um, but the reason I mention it is because we don't have an equivalent case um, on the Irish equivalent legislation, which is the Construction Contracts Act. And it's important because <clears throat> the way these uh, projects, the payment regimes in these projects are structured, a lot of milestone payments apply, you know, payment depends on certain events occurring um, and, you know, quite often every 30 days is not going to be something which flies as, as a payment term uh, in a project of this scale. So in Irish construction projects, if, if that were to apply, you'd have difficulty squaring that circle. Um, uh, so it, because it mandates regular payments be made. Um, now, my own impression is that the courts in Ireland will, will, will probably go the same way as the UK courts, but there's no guarantee there. Um, they could interpret it in a different way. Um, so it's just being mindful of that and um, something to be raised with your, your construction lawyers if you were involved in developing out one of these projects. Um, in the UK as well, they have an energy carve out for their payment legislation. So uh, where the primary activity of, of the project is power generation. Um, that effectively means that you can't rely on, on the Act. The Irish legislation does not have, again, does not have an equivalent provision. Um, it, it does have a, a, a bit about power supply, but to my mind, that's more about power supply to the site of construction rather than the primary activity being power supply. So yeah, just worth mentioning, as I say, uh, payment regime in these contracts really needs to be carefully thought out and um, sometimes you know, as a construction lawyer, uh, when I get the, the financial model given to me and I look at the way the payments are going to be structured, sometimes it's, it's extremely difficult to square that circle and it just needs a little bit of um, thought um, in, in, in terms of how that works in, in the legislation. Okay, well, sort of returning then to the, um, the detail of how you harmonise uh, the technical aspects uh, of, of contracts with, with the, the sort of legal body of the contract. As lawyers, you know, I think, we, we have a habit of, of, of getting um, lost a little bit in, 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 in the main body of the contract. Um, we're great at drafting these contracts, which are really robust, um, but we, we have a tendency to pay less attention to the technical schedules. And as I say, as a projects lawyer, this is the biggest challenge, um, is, is ensuring that this all fits together. The last thing you want is to have a really well drafted contract that then all of a sudden you, you get a USB stick at the end of it all and that's your technical appendices that go on and attach onto the contract. Um, you should be reviewing the technical appendices and they should be embedded in that contract as early as possible so that the lawyers can go through each of them and check that nothing contradicts 
uh, the, the main body of the contract. And the reason I say that is because quite often uh, technical schedules will um, contain express exclusions um, in, in relation to what is and what is not to be provided under the contracts um, and in terms of specification. So it's really important. And a really a case that really highlights that is the um, case of MT Hogard, um, which was involved a wind farm in the Solway for a, a few years ago. And it, it always gets brought up um, at construction legal conferences. Uh, effectively, the project had a, a 20, or one of the technical schedules had a 20 year warranty for um, the foundations. Um, and the court construed that as being sort of a fitness for purpose warranty. And equally, there was the J101 standard, which applied to the construction of, um, of, the, of, the, of the foundations of the wind farm at the Solway Firth, and it contained an error in the calculation. Now, the J101 standard is an internationally, or was at that time, an internationally recognized uh, standard, but because it contained an error, um, there were deficiencies in the foundations. Um, so hence, there was, there was a problem for the contractor. So again, there's a, another a small example of um, how the technical appendices can contradict the underlying uh, terms of the contract. And I'm, I'm saying this um, you know, from experience because when uh, I've worked with contractors from, 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 from all over the world and you know, the language barrier itself can be a little bit of a challenge as well because you may have uh, foreign law concepts that are trying to be introduced into Irish or UK contracts um, and sometimes they just don't necessarily translate. Um, so you yeah, really have to sit down and think that through. Um, uh, you know, and, and you will, in an occasion, get documents that are in a different language as well. So if you're ever buying um, certain components from Holland, uh, an example of that would be the Dutch metal uni conditions are very popular. And you know, they arrive in Dutch, so you have to go through and translate them. Um, and then they don't translate perfectly. So there's another example of how you have to go through and, and work out um, what's the best way to present that within your English contract. Um, in terms of bespoke clauses for managing risk, well, I think I mentioned earlier, um, proximity arrangements are, are important. Uh, so you know, if you've got cables running past other cables or pipelines running us other pipelines or, or, or certain structures in close proximity, it's really important setting out how they're dealt with. Um, in project agreements for offshore projects, I've never seen recitals that are that are longer than in, than in offshore projects. So they're the, the, the paragraphs that you see at the start of the contract, which set out the, the purpose of the contract and the intentions of the parties in very broad terms. Sometimes these can run into to several pages. Um, I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, some contracts you just see, here's the intention of the party, they want to build a, a wind farm and for the, 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 the other party is willing to sign up to us um, on, on the basis of the terms that follow. The best ones, uh, the best contracts have, you know, 10 or so recitals setting out in detail what the rules of the parties are. So there's no confusion at the very beginning. And it means that in the event of a dispute, you can go back to the beginning and a judge or, or an arbitrator can look at it and go, well, this is what the party's intentions were at the beginning when they signed up to this contract. So. Um, I think it's useful. Um, it sets out the project objectives uh, and also responsibility for licensing and permitting. Uh, I mentioned um, Brexit and COVID here. I'm not going to dwell on either for very long, but it, it, offshore projects are no different to onshore projects. Uh, we have now Brexit clauses that come into our contracts and COVID clauses. So they're quite similar in the sense that you know it's who how you deal with cost increases as a result of those events um what happens in the event of a site shut down um for covid and um, what happens if you know materials are delayed uh, at the border um you know who pays for the customs increases in costs in, in relation to brexit so those clauses well the brexit clauses have certainly become more refined over time and now the brexit has occurred um, they're, they're, they're much easier to um, set out as a foreseeable event. Uh, COVID clauses, um, they're, 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 they're still being developed as time goes on and getting more and more refined. Um, and definition of the sea area, it may, it may sound really simple and straightforward, but you know, if you, there's a lot of exclusivity agreements in this space. You might have 
an investor looking for a developer to go and find a particular site um, and you know they want it in this particular sea area so it, it, it behooves you to, to have an accurate um, definition of that and you know um, with reference to charts and everything else uh, bespoke amendments required to include vessel spreads um, burial performance criteria um, you know uh, information in relation to um, unexploded ordnance uh, knock for knock um, indemnity regime and, and what the role setting up what the role of, of, of the marine warranty surveyor will be that's very important in the FIDIC 2017 edition contract particularly in relation to uh, professional indemnity insurance obligations of the contractor uh, as I say there's a lot of exclusivity agreements out there um, so it's very important for contractors and developers who are you know, going investigating a site to be careful about how much responsibility they're taking on at an early stage uh, in the EPC structure, it's essential that if you are taking on a lot of responsibility for project delivery, that that's all dovetailed downstream with so that you're passing on a lot of that risk to your, your subcontractors. And um, that's that's extremely important, particularly in relation to payment. Um, and force majeure is typically more bespoke. So I, I just um, pulled this from a, an offshore contract that we did um, last year. And you can see that that was that was our bespoke amendment to the to the force majeure clause. Um, so uncharted subsea wrecks, you know, Ireland has loads of wrecks, sea wrecks, um, uh, as does uh, GB. Um, uncharted explosive dumping grounds, well, we all know that. Um, that the RC is, is full of of, of unexploded um, ordnance, um, and in some cases, they don't know where that is. Um, uh, abnormal sea or tidal conditions, unforeseen subsea military or naval activity. Well, anyone that spends time in the water knows that, that that's very real it can happen at any stage and it can interrupt the project um adverse weather uh, rendering it impossible or unsafe to carry out work uh, and maritime emergencies so you can see there um there's th 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 there are a number of bespoke events that, that could stop a project in its tracks and uh, force majeure is, is effectively you know a situation where parties have to agree well everything stops uh, and no one takes on any risk in that scenario. Um, in terms of typical inputs, well, the delivery port would usually be defined within the contract. Um, for, for there's a lot of very large structures that are being handled. You want to get the nearest staging post as possible. If you're building, um, you know, if you're building a, a project um, on the west of Ireland, you want a port in the west of Ireland probably, and um, that's capable of handling those structures probably Cork. Um, you don't want them to be sort of, you know, um, arriving at some other port, um, which is further away, because um, then you've got the cost of transport and delivery. Um, meaning of delivery is an important one. Um, so if you're delivering the structures, at what stage does the party who's accepting them take responsibility for those structures? What happens if the crane breaks as they're being loaded on the docks and all that sort of thing? So one of the um, uh, definitions that we landed upon in an offshore project was it'll mean the point in time when um, the equipment is offloaded from the ship or vessel transporting the equipment to the project country upon um, such ship or vessel docking in the project port uh, and delivery and deliver will be construed uh, accordingly. Um, and you know you might you might have power purchase agreements that are uh, conditional within the project agreement so there might be reference to that and the whole contract might depend on the implementation of a power purchase agreement. It's very relevant when you've got a lot of sort of private sector developers, data center owners and, and whatnot who are looking to effectively have corporate PPAs um, for their own projects. So they have their own wind farm that powers their, powers their facility. Um, that's becoming increasingly common in Ireland. Um, and commodities indexation is very important as well, given the, let's say, the costs of these projects. Um, there's a lot of precious metals used and um, these, this is a mechanism for how you deal with commodities indexation and, and cost percentage increases. And these clauses can be actually quite complicated. They come in the form of an equation um, set out within the contract document itself. Um, so in, in terms of um, you know, site conditions, this is moving all very fast at the moment um, in terms of, 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 of the survey methods. I mean, we've now got unmanned surface vessels. Um, that's probably something that you'll now see specified specifically within the construction contracts that that, that 
they all should be used and have performance criteria around how they should operate. Um, you're going to have detailed protocols around corrosion protection, leaking, leakage, condensation, and ceilings protocols. They're not offshore construction is construction, but it's it's construction not as we know it. And um, there's a lot much more that can go wrong um, uh, when 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 projects are constructed constructed at sea. Um, and that, that comes into the whole concept of excusable delays, concurrency clauses, and knock-on delays. I mean, just one ship, a jack-up vessel could be sitting in port with a broken engine, and the nearest vessel could be a thousand miles away. So how, how do you deal with the delay if the delay is a week for the, for the vessel to turn up um, and replace it and get another crew on board? Um, all these sort of things have to be considered and carefully planned out within the contracts. Um, there's detailed protocols around testing. I mentioned warranty periods earlier in the, the context of the MT Hogard case. Uh, the base performance benchmark, this was a concept that I was introduced to in relation to uh, the wave energy project that I was working on. Um, and it, it's the concept that basically a certain level of failure will not just be tolerated, it's, 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 it's expected um, given the scale of the project. So it, 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 it's what minimum level of base performance you can have um, without breaching your contract going forward. So that, that's an example of that. Um, and then you're going to have, you know, clear delineation between onshore work and offshore work, grid connections, substations, uh, inspection and testing plans, um, cabling. The big one that I, I think is worth mentioning is financial modeling. I, 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 I say this because um, I say this because when it comes to schedules, I tend to get the, the financial model sent to me at the last minute. It's a movable feast until the very last minute. And then it comes in an Excel spreadsheet, which gets printed off and sort of stuck on the back page of the whole document and forgotten about. But mark my words, if there's ever a dispute, the financial model is usually the first place that people will look. So um, I think as time goes on, that these financial models are becoming more like living, breathing documents. And there's actually a number of very enterprising companies, there's one in Ireland that, that are working on sort of live financial modeling information. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how those develop. But there's a lot of movement in the software, but I think the days of simple Excel spreadsheets being printed off and stuck on as a schedule, um, are, are, are they're gonna soon be behind us. Um, okay, well, just coming to, 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 to closing up, I, I think it's worth mentioning um, interface coordination. Um, the key thing on these projects is having an experienced team that knows what they're at, has worked on these types of projects before, has familiarity. Um, you know, if you take an onshore project, for example, a large onshore project, uh, say like a, a terminal at an airport, a main contractor is going to have porter cabins of um, graduate quantity surveyors literally filling out claim forms every day on the project. And the project manager could receive hundreds of these claims on a daily basis. And I describe them as claims. They're really just cost increases for little things that have changed on the project. Well, multiply that by 50, and that's what you're going to have in an offshore project. The, the scale of unknowns is significant. So there's going to be huge contingencies there. Um, and you're going to see risk registers unlike anything you've seen before. So as I say, the practical commercial mitigants are ensuring that um, you have a project team that knows what they're doing. Uh, and as I say, the success or failure of a project um, can really depend on how the project agreements are put together. It's all good and well planning a project and saying this is all going to work out well and this is what it's going to cost. But if the construction agreements are not robust enough, it's going to fail. Um, uh, so it needs to be carefully considered. So in conclusion, uh, offshore projects in Ireland uh, represent one of the biggest um, opportunities um, over the next decade. Um, understanding the framework and being mindful of the risks is, is very important. Um, and being mindful of how much upstream risk you're taking on, particularly in conditional arrangements, is, is, is very important. Uh, and as I say, marrying the, the technical and commercial inputs with the legals is often the greatest challenge and poses the greatest risk. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm happy to take your questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Jamie. That was, that was brilliant.
considering we set you quite a challenge to uh, fit such a detailed topic into a relatively short space of time. Um, I definitely learned a lot there, um, having not known much at all about Irish law, particularly offshore as well. Um, so I will sort of, we do have time for a couple of questions. If anyone does, um, feel free to either raise your hand um, or I don't know if there's any in the chat. Um, we just had one come in. So TJ is just asking, what are your thoughts on the map bill? Um, I think I, I think I have a lot of optimism towards it. Um, I, I've talked to a number of developers in this space who are a little bit pessimistic around the timelines. Um, and there's there is concern within the industry that it won't be ready in time for these developments. I mean, you look at the timelines, 2025, we have the, this sort of first target um, that we have to meet. And that really means action this year. You've seen some pretty significant um, consortiums being formed uh, in the last 12 months around renewables projects and really big household names uh, coming and looking at Ireland and, and forming JVs. They, they need to have certainty in order to start developing out these projects. So we need to see action on the bill within the next six months, realistically, for anything proper to happen. I, I'm, I'm forever the optimist, um, but you know, uh, I, I think I, 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 I'm more inclined to, to, to listen to what I'm hearing from within the industry. I think it probably will take a little bit longer to implement. Mm, yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. It was. It, I'd not heard of that before, um, so it was good to learn about that. And I, have you sort of noticed any challenges, particularly with, say, the, the wave and tidal industries in Ireland, uh, with them being sort of newer compared to offshore wind and maybe not quite as well established yet? Has there been any challenges in, in terms of the legal matters with regards to wave and tidal particularly? Yeah, um, it's it's sort of fledgling um, technology, uh, wind or sorry, wave power. So um, I mean, there there are we, when we were, were acting for the for the for the client that, that we were working with, they were sort of a new startup with a lot of very experienced project engineers, and um, they they really um, were selling their their projects more internationally than within Europe. Um, and now, as their projects have caught on globally, and the technology is, is becoming more and more proven. Um, the, the Irish market is now much more seriously looking towards it. And I think from what I understand, it's more um, in a context of a hybrid solution. So you're, you're looking at, at a mixture of wind and wave now more than just pure wave uh, projects. I think for a while there, there was um, a concern that, that, that wave power wouldn't necessarily lend itself to the Irish coastline, um, uh, as I had understood it, but that, 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 that there's... There's no changes in the technology that that, 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 will, that will make that more amenable. Um, but yeah, that's that's probably been the biggest challenge is the fact that it is such new technology um, that, that you know, people are more familiar with and comfortable with wind. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I can, I can see that. Um, uh, David, did you have a question at all? Yeah, I, I was going to just not put it into chat because I didn't know how to type it. But uh, <laughs> I, I would be interested. Thanks, Jamie, for that. That was very informative. Um, I'm very interested in the different contracts and, and the risk profile, but something I'm trying to figure out is, um, is res and auctions and how you finance projects based on res when, when they're, they're very, it's a very uncertain process, um, yeah. strictly ports and things like that. Do you think uh, they start looking at more government contracts, concession contracts, or you know, how risky is it? Financing a hundred million euro project based on a on an auction. Yeah, well, to my to my knowledge, I I'm, I, I think I'm I'm right in saying this. There hasn't been an offshore auction yet um, on, on Res, um, and I mean we we've, we've been keeping very very close tabs on it. So until that happens, and you know there's a bit of more familiarity with the process, um, as you say, there there is going to be a little bit of, of uncertainty. But the the principle is there. I mean. It, companies will be factoring that into their financial models um, in terms of how the renewable energy support scheme works. And the fact that it's come in now is, you know, it's a game changer. We were waiting for it for a long time. 
Um, but yeah, I think until the first um, until the first auction happens, it'll be hard to say how, how it'll all unfold. And and do you think like I mean that this this is why I get I get uh, confused is I mean these ports and terminals and um, they're going to have to be built anyway, uh, yeah. no matter who's building the wind farms. So what what I'm trying to keep to understand is why you know there isn't more uh, of a drive from government to uh, get get these done now because we're going to need them anyway. Yeah, no, no, I agree, and I think that's part of the the problem is we're going to face this massive bottleneck um, if. If we get to the point where map is passed and then there's this real rush to to build loads of, of wind farms off the west of Ireland and um, and all of around Ireland and um, you know we don't have the, the capacity to handle these significant offshore structures. I mean they're huge. You know they're, and the, the further you go out to see with the offshore projects um, and the floating offshore uh, wind farms, you know the, the, the structures get bigger and bigger. So as you say. Um, having the facilities to deal with that, they're going to have to be built um, and having the infrastructure around that. So it is, it's, 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 it's slightly disheartening um, that, that, that ha we haven't seen a, a greater scale because I'm, I'm imagining somewhere like Galway as well would be very well, not just Cork, but Galway would be very well placed to deal with some of these very large structures. Um, so you know, there's, there's probably going to have to be in the next few years, significant um, development. And I know Galway Port is going through a big transformation um, with the, with their redevelopment, um, I think there's a 2020 to 2026 plan they have in place there, um, and new breakwaters. Um, so that that might be something that that will, will increase the, the the size and scope of of their ability to deliver. Um, but yeah, it, it's not across the board. It's not on the scale that you would like to see. Hmm. Or we'll all be going to Belfast. I think that looks like. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it's one of the, the it's where they built the Titanic, one of the, the largest dry docks in the world. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, David, for your question. Um, we just got another question in from TJ. Um, is there any mention of multi use of space in offshore construction? Um, so, presumably, you're talking more about hybrid solutions then. So, the, in the scenario where you're saying you know, you'd have wind and wave in the same place, um, I think that 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 is there is a drive and then tidal as well. If that's if that's what you're saying in terms of multi-use, I think yeah, that's that's very much um, uh, the, the, there is a drive to to make that happen. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is you know when you do have fledgling technology, um, that it can sort of benefit from the fact that there's an established model there with say wind power, you can then put the, 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 the wave power or the tidal power alongside that. That's certainly my understanding of it. Um, the, the technical people will probably tell me more about it. Sorry, I've got a very noisy dog downstairs, <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> um, yeah, we just had a, uh, had a comment from Janine there. Um, about about the the res, Jamie. So um, I'll let you just have a look at that. Um, but I suppose just to to round up um, as maybe a last question, maybe a bit of a tough question. I've asked it to a couple of our experts in the series. But do you have a sort of key piece of takeaway advice um, for businesses entering the industry that maybe just um, don't know a lot about the, the legal considerations in Ireland, particularly? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to try and do this in a way that doesn't sound like I'm trying to sell uh, my service to you. But um, uh, basically, anyone that's successful, I think, in this space has paid attention to what their contracts are going to look like. And they've really put some effort into that. So um, the early stage startups um, who are dealing with new technology, they, they've really put time and effort into developing a contractual solution. So what will happen in many cases is that you would have a funder or an investor that would come in at some point and they'll want to see all of this ready-made and prepared and well thought out. So if you have a contract that's sitting there and you're saying, well, here's our financial model, here's what the technical aspects will look like and here's what the contract will look like, you've covered off nearly three of the main pieces. So it's, 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 one, of the, it's one of the pillars um, that, that a funder or an investor will look at. Um, so it, it, it pays to sit down with your lawyers and try and figure out 
how it's going to be structured and, and what the contract is going to look like. That would be my, my, my best advice. Brilliant, thank you. Well, I think um, if there are no more questions at the moment, um, we'll probably wrap up for today. So I say thank you very much indeed, Jamie, for your time and brilliant presentation uh, this morning. It's very informative um, and good advice to attendees. Uh, and thank you again to attendees for joining us today. Um, just a reminder that um, the event has been recorded and will be shared for um, you to share or look back on. Um, and I'll just say, um, I would encourage everyone, if you haven't already, just to sign up to the Selkie newsletter to keep up to date on the project uh, activities and events that we're running. Um, and you can also follow us on LinkedIn and join our discussion group on there as well. Um, so I think coming up next in this couple of weeks time, we have two sessions um, on health and safety. So we'll be having a UK Welsh based session uh, with Watson Old Renewables in the morning and uh, one with Irish Marine Safety in the afternoon. So hopefully getting a good cross-border um, comparison there of health and safety. So definitely take a look at those. And I think links will be in the chat to further sessions in the future as well. Um, so I'll just say thank you very much to everyone and I uh, hope you all have a great day and the rest of the week. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jamie. Bye.